It took developers time to explore the intricacies of the SID and its idiosyncrasies. But even in the very earliest games, you can see the influence of the popular music of the day shaping the game soundtracks. Musically, David Whittaker, the coder behind the early Commodore hit Lazy Jones, was a new romantic long before he got into video game music. The new romantics, in contrast to the aggressive austerity of punk, built their music around a synthetic sound that was, initially at any rate, quite eerie and sterile, which was, at least in part, a consequence of the musicians exploring the capabilities of the digital synths that were entering the market in the early 1980s. Over time, dance-infused rhythms and arpeggiated synth sequences were incorporated into the music, and by the mid-1980s, the British synth pop that had grown out of new romanticism had a warmer, punchier sound. And that was the sound that Whitaker adopted for his best known soundtrack, Lazy Jones. <laughs> music uses only two of the three voices of the said chip. The third was reserved for sound effects. The music is simple but effective. Strong melodies supported by a bouncing bass line played in broken octaves. That bass line provides a sense of continuity and a dynamic movement to what might otherwise be quite a static synthetic track. Already a staple of 1980s era synth pop, think New Order's Blue Monday, it became one of the key characteristics not just of C64 music, but of 8 bit video game sound in general. As developers began to unlock the capabilities of the SID, the musical data and its timing became more and more complex. Most SID musicians wrote custom code, a sound driver in assembly language to manage it all. Now, ostensibly, sound drivers all do exactly the same thing. They take musical data and they use it to manipulate the SID's registers. But just as the touch of different musicians can sculpt very different performances from the same instrument, the code of different computer musicians could impart very different sounds from the same hardware. Take vibrato, for example. That slight pitch modulation that gives a sound movement. There are all sorts of unique characteristics to it. There's the delay between the note and the vibrato onset. There's the vibrato depth, the rate and so on. All of that detail, that performance technique is coded in the driver and everybody did it differently. But of all the game composers of that time, perhaps the best known and the one who most skillfully combined an innate sense of musicality and coding prowess was Rob Hubbard. At a time when the industry was still professionalizing, he brought the work ethic of a professional musician. I met up with Rob and I asked him how writing music in code rather than on manuscript paper might have changed his approach to music making. Rob. Hi. How did you get started? In, in video game composition? I was working as a musician doing plenty of gigs and at the time you know all the press was saying if you're a musician you need to start learning about computers because that's going to be very important and um, so that's what I did and I just uh, learned how to program and uh, I um, looked at educational software and that was basically a non-starter. So then I looked at the game side of it, and that's how I got into um, doing the music for games. It wasn't quite as straightforward as that, but essentially that's what happened. So you were already quite a, an accomplished professional musician before you started writing video game music. Yeah, yeah. Those professional musicianship skills, did they come in useful? Yeah, I think that when you start learning an instrument as a kid, and then you develop your skills as a teenager, and then work as a professional musician. What you learn is discipline. You have to be very focused and disciplined to learn an instrument in the first place. 
And uh, if you work as a musician, you, you have to be very professional about what you do. Otherwise, you might not keep the job, you know. Um, so when I got asked to do stuff, you know, they wanted it at a certain time and everything else. It was, it was always right there. It was always delivered, no matter, you know, how much work you had to do. Um, so I think that uh, professionalism and discipline really came, comes in very useful, or came in very useful. And could you describe what your process of working was like? How easy was it to convert your musical ideas into machine code? Um, it was actually quite tedious um, and quite difficult. The process involved for me, I used to write sketches on uh, uh, paper and then I would um, uh, code them up in assembly language machine code, which is all a lot of hexadecimal numbers. And then I would basically uh, work on maybe two to four bars at a time. And uh, I was able to ed edit, um, synthesize the parameters, and I could edit the music in real time and try to get it to sound the best way I could before moving on, and then develop the the composition that way. It was never a case of writing out six minutes worth of music on manuscript paper and then coding the whole thing up and then trying to hope that you hadn't made any mistakes. So even though you were working on a computer, there was still an element of kind of performance about it, a bit like a, a synth yeah. player twiddling yeah. with knobs. Yeah, exactly, yeah. It's, instead of twiddling with the knobs like you would on like a, a Moog or something like that, I was twiddling with numbers in real time, you know, changing things to the uh, absolute um, maximum I could squeeze out of the little SID chip that was in the C64, changing things from 1C to 1B, then to 1E, until then I would adjust things like the cutoff point of the note length to, for the release to try to sound right, all these kind of things. You fine tune it just to the nth degree as much as you could. And you mentioned the SID chip. So through a combination of the, the SID hardware, your coding and your musicianship, you were able to write some very sophisticated music. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and I could hear elements of maybe Larry Fast or, or Philip Glass coming yeah. through in your music. Yeah. What was it about the C64 that allowed you to explore that sort of experimental compositional landscape? Um, I think it was a combination of, of, of all those things, but it was mainly the, the software aspect of it. Um, the fact that you had complete control of, of what was going on in terms of the structure of the music with the software is very easy to, um, get in, to get into those kind of more minimalistic type of styles, which were also popular in the, in the eight, eight, mid-80s. There was quite a strong... Um, you know, people like Kraftwerk, people like Jean-Michel Jarre, uh, Larry Fast is somebody I stumbled across, well, stumbled upon. And um, there was the kind of, in the pop side of it, there was the new romantic kind of movement with all the synth, synth bands. Um, so that kind of played into it as well. Um, so the synthesizer element was very strong. And the, on the compositional side, the software allowed you to uh, kind of explore some of those other possibilities. I mean, part of my dreams that I had at that time was was if I had like two Profit 5 synth synthesizers that I could control with a microprocessor, then that would have been the ultimate, you know. And so as well as innovating musically, you were able to innovate technically too. Back in the 1980s, you were exploring ideas around adaptive music and interactive music with things like the Mixi-Load system. Yeah. Could you tell us anything about that? Um, the, one of the things that happened was through the software, you can control all sorts of synth parameters like pulse width modulation. You can control just about any uh, aspect on the, on the synth chip, but also when you're writing code to control the actual structure of what the music is, it then became quite apparent that you could then take that to the next level and then try to come up with uh, ideas to try to make it more interactive with uh, what was going on with graphics. At the time, 
um, I was starting to think about um, the idea of uh, probability-based type of um, things you could do with even within on a C64, where you could get a, a complex kind of baseline or something, and then add like assignments to the notes of probabilities that they would trigger, and then based upon an input from somewhere else, you would then get uh, various degrees of intensity of what that was going to produce. And then uh, not only that, you could then control certain other aspects like uh, harmony and uh, uh, what kind of sound you would get with the with the lead instrument, the melody, where you know things like that, you could then do um, more uh, interactively. And by the end of its life, you were really pushing the limits of what the Commodore 64 could do musically. At one point, you even made it sound like Jimi Hendrix. The, <sighs> How were you able to squeeze the, those extra voices? Uh, people uh, were being able to start doing some real primitive speech things on the C64. So I, um, I started to explore how, it, how all that stuff kind of worked. And then um, once I figured out what was going on, they were using the fast, um, non-maskable interrupt running at, you know, I think about the maximum you could get out of it was five or six uh, kilohertz. So which is at 5,006 times, five or 6,000 times a second. And you, you by manipulating the volume register, which was only four bits, you could get four bit samples running at about five or six k, which <laughs> you know, seems ludicrous at the time. But um, it was a, it was a way of trying to, you know, take the take that sound to the next level. And it worked really well with a dis heavy kind of distorted guitar guitar sample, which I'd managed to get from a friend of mine who had an old Akai sampler. And um, also, you know, tr I, can, I m could digitize some organ chords and then try to get those to loop <laughs> at four bit samples at five kilohertz. And then by changing the speed of that interrupt, you could then change, you know, get that old, we used to call it munchkinizing, <laughs> you know, where the samples are just, you munchkinize down when you take the sample rate down. Um, and, you know, Sometimes the earliest noise that you get from the samples kind of added to the sound a little bit. But it was a real juggling act to try to get it all to work because the volume register then kind of screwed up some of the, the synth sounds that were going on. So you would have to just work like crazy to try to get it all to, to work and sound reasonable. But the idea of... Um, changing the pitch of a guitar sample or like a, or other waveforms that I used to do was uh, the thing that was unique at the time. Mm. Rob, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot.